Today I'm going to be talking about what I've learned from teaching with AI. Before I get into how I've used it for teaching, I'm just going to do a quick overview on generative AI so that we're all on the same page. So generative AI is an artificial intelligence technique. And this technique learns patterns from data and then performs some sort of modeling based on it to provide an output. So this data can be in the form of text, images, speech, or any sort of data. We perform some sort of machine learning out model on it, and we get an output. This output, again, can be any of those different forms of data. The aim is to mimic human-created content, and the most common example people are aware of is ChatGPT. ChatGPT was released in November 30th, 2022, and it was one of the fastest uptake of technology or apps, social media, that has happened to date. So the time to a million users for ChatGPT was just five days. When we compare this to other social media out there, platforms, Spotify, Facebook, Twitter, and Netflix, these are all five months to 3.5 years for Netflix. Same thing can be said for the time to 1 million users, where ChatGPT only took two months to get to 100 million users. TikTok, Instagram, Pinterest, Spotify, these all took many months, nine months for TikTok to 55 months for Spotify. This came with the problems that come with something exploding so quickly, we didn't have time to learn about it or think about how we're going to integrate this into our teaching and how it's going to affect how our students learn. And so because of all this, it created many problems. But now we've had a little more time to start to think about chat GPT and its impact on teaching. There was a study I want to talk about first, which was a study of 1,600 researchers throughout the world um, this was published in Nature, and it looked at what researchers think of AI, specifically generative AI, like ChatGPT. And they asked them, how useful do you think AI tools are for researchers in your field? And respondents who use AI were saying about 80% said they were between essential to useful. This was slightly lower with respondents who don't use AI, or about 50% or so saying that. AI tools were either going to be essential, very useful, or useful. And then when we expand this to how useful you think AI tools would be in the coming decade, these numbers go up even more. We're almost to about 80% of, or close to 100, over 90% of researchers who use AI saying that they expect these tools will be useful in the field. And if these tools are going to play such an important role within the fields, then this is something we need to be thinking about teaching our students to learn about. And I don't think there's something we can ignore, as if they're going to be so important, our students need to know how to deal with them and need to know what to do about them and think about what are the pros of these methods and what are the cons of these methods as well. In this same survey, they asked the researchers, what they thought the benefits of AI or generative AI specifically is, so models like ChatGPT. And the biggest benefit that these researchers saw was that generative AI helps researchers with, who are non-native English speakers improve their language. So editing or translation of documents. Other applications that researchers saw were encoding, summarizing research, writing, and improving just general scientific tasks. So we're seeing a lot of benefits that these tools may have. And then when they looked at the positive impacts of these, again, there was lots of positive impacts highlighted by these researchers, ways to look through data. So data analysis ways came up, computations, saving time and money, getting new types of data process that we weren't able to do before. So we're able to highlight a lot of different benefits. And these are the types of things we need to be highlighting to our students and getting our students to understand the benefits of these. But with the benefit comes the negatives. There are negatives of these tools. And in the same survey, the biggest negative that came about was the proliferation of misinformation. And this is very important fact that we need to get across to our students and be aware of. Uh, chat GPT-4 was stated to hallucinate information or give incorrect facts 9 to 12% of the time. So 1 in 10 times you're using it, you're not getting a factually correct statement. And so the danger here is too that chat GPT will always give a gr grammatically correct answer. So although that information may not come, is not true, it comes across in an authoritative manner in which you 
think that that information may be true. Compared to the Google, when you Google something, maybe the website looks, it's a sketchy website, you might not trust that. You don't get that same feedback from ChatGPT. Um, other problems that came up were making plagiarism easier, harder to detect, and just bringing in this false information into the, both into research and into teaching. They also looked at the negative impacts of AI, and it looks at that le leads to a reliance on pattern recognition without understanding. So you're recognizing the pa patterns in the data, but you don't understand what that means. You're not able to th synthesize the data the same way. And we're entrenching the biases or discrimination in data. So all of these generative AI models, they're trained on a set of data. They know what was in that initial data they were given. They do not know things outside of that initial set of data. And so any, hi, yeah. any information outside of that area, the models don't know about. And so this is partly what comes to that misinformation. The model doesn't know about it, it can't present that information. So one big thing that comes about with AI is plagiarism, cheating, and that led to the creation of AI detection software. And so OpenAI, which is the company that created ChatGPT, they released their own plagiarism detection software. It doesn't work. It was able to successfully identify AI-generated text 26% of the time. One in four chance that it was correctly identifying this AI-generated text that its own code generated as AI. And then it also misclassified human-written text as AI on 9% of the time. Um, so these are pretty poor stats for a tool that we're using to detect if it's AI-generated or human-generated. Let's can go further. And there was a study that tested nine different AI detection tools. And for this, they sped through real TOEFL essays. So these are essays written by non-native English speakers. And when they fed through these real essays, the tools Average said that 61% of these really written essays were AI generated. They took a data set of real US eighth grade essays, fed it through the tools. Now only 5% were AI generated. And so this is showing a bias towards non-native English speakers that are going to be very problematic in the use of these AI detection softwares. They're not something we can reliably use. Furthermore, you can give prompts to AI. So if you take these real TOEFL essays, tell AI or chat GPT, enhance the word choices. You do that, now 11% of those essays are determined as AI written, significantly reduced how many are thought to be written by AI. And then we can do the opposite. We can take those eighth grade essays, we can tell the AI, please simplify the word choices. If it does that, now it identifies 56% as AI generated. So there are these prompts that you can use to modify how the AI detection tools would respond to these. These are all over the internet. So if we can find them pretty simply by a Google search, so can our students. And our students would quit very quickly learn what prompts they have to give these tools in order to mispass detection and not be targeted by this. So there's no way we're gonna be able to use these AI detection software. So what's the path forward? I think we need to learn to work with AI. We need to teach our students about these tools. We need to teach them about the pros and cons and the type of information that you are going to get from these different tools. And so in preparing for this presentation, I asked my colleagues in the biochemistry department who was using AI tools in their teaching, whether it be an assignment or just a class discussion. And I had a number of my colleagues come back to me that over the last year and a half or so that they've integrated an AI tool within their class. So we have seven classes within the last year who've done this. And so in next, I'm going to go through some examples of how these tools have been used in teaching. These include both examples of my own teaching as well as examples that my colleagues have shared with me in other classes to give a more broad um, introduction to the different ways these tools are being integrated. One other thing though, when we're using the, you're teaching about AI tools, I know I'm doing this and I think um, many other colleagues in the department are, is we're telling our students that 
while we are being integrating these AI tools and we are allowing them to use for their classwork, not everyone is. And they can't apply what we have taught them or our rules we have stated saying they can use them to every other class. That for each class, you need to talk with your professor and learn if using an AI tool is appropriate for that class. And this is a case by case basis. So although we're teaching it, we're also telling the students to be aware that there are limitations and not everyone is okay with using these tools. So the first example I'm gonna talk about is in a third year course within the department. This is a physical biochemistry course that I'm teaching this semester. Um, so what I did first is I lectured about AI and biochemistry and healthcare. We went through examples of how AI goes from data to generate a prediction so we could understand the basis of how AI works. We then, uh, the students are doing an assignment. These are due this week, so I can't tell you how well the assignment worked yet, but what they, I can tell you about the process so far of working through the students and answering their questions on it. Um, as a class, we asked ChatGPT, how is AI used in biochemistry and healthcare? We asked for a list of 50 items. There are 44 students in the class. Each student's gonna get a topic and they have to write an assignment based on how AI is used in that specific area. The students had to then find sources. They need to go do a scientific literature search on any of the databases that we use. So we talked about using PubMed or Web of Science uh, and Google Scholar Scopus. So different websites you can use to find real um, scientific sources. And they have to use these sources to back up the claims made by ChatGPT. And they have to write this assignment for a general audience. So we talked about one of the biggest hurdles right now in applying AI in healthcare is that people don't trust AI. And they don't trust it because they don't understand it. So part of this assignment was to get the students to be able to communicate to the general public whether AI was a good tool for moving forward or if it had too many problems and that we shouldn't be trusting it moving forward. Um, the students were allowed to use AI to help with the assignment writing, chat GPT if they wanted to, because the main focus I wanted to do for this assignment was finding verified information and reading the literature. I wasn't marking them on how well they wrote. And so, but if they use AI to help, they have to acknowledge it. They have to provide an acknowledgement statement in this of what chat GPT did or what AI did versus what they do and give that appropriate credit. We talked about ethical use of these tools, that we can't get AI to do everything. That's the same as that buying an essay off someone. This is not an ethical use. And so they needed to make sure whatever that acknowledgement they said that AI did fit within the ethics of using that tool. Uh, Dr. Sherry Christian did a very similar type assignment in immunology where she did prompts from chat GPT on immune system health. The students then had to go and find sources and look at the reliability of this information. So both of these assignments are really focusing on getting the students to identify reliable information and compare that to with what they're getting from chat GPT and determine is that information reliable? How do we find reliable information? What is the value of, and what is the value of scientific research? Um, Dr. Zara Farnak also used the tools in uh, the sports and exercise nutrition course, this third year course, and she got the students to compare the information they get from chat GPT to the scientific literature. So they had to pick a sports supplement on the market and identify its health and performance claims, understand the mechanism of action, and validate the claims. So they compared the two methods and gave an oral presentation saying what they thought each method was good at. Um, most said chat GPT was really quick, good short summaries of information. Didn't give them much depth, but it, it let them get the hang of the idea before they jumped into that scientific literature. Gave them a starting point to go off of. Um, they said chat GPT didn't really give them the details on the mechanism of action, and it wasn't giving them much for citations. Well, and chat GPT won't give you citations. PubMed, they said it gave them robust scientific information. They were really able to identify the difference in information you get from these two sources. Another interesting part of this is that uh, Dr. Farnax uh, surveyed her students before and after it on their opinions on ChatGPT. 
So before the assignment, she asked if they'd used it. Most of them are using generative AI with the most common tool they're using is ChatGPT. Um, and they use it for checking out anything new or unfamiliar to get that really quick summary of that information. They find it's quicker than doing a Google search if they just want a quick summary. At the end of the assignment, she asked, are you still going to use ChatGPT now that you know its limits? And they said, yeah. We know its limits, but it's still useful in giving us that quick information and that we need to use it in combination of those scientific sources like using PubMed to get information. They really see that value in how quickly ChatGPT can give them information. It was, they saw it as that initial step, but then they could go validate it with scientific literature. In uh, proteins course, so this fourth year biochemistry course, Dr. Valerie Booth did another assignment using ChatGPT, and in turn, she got the students to use ChatGPT for the writing. And so she asked the, the students each had a topic, and the first thing they had is they used chat, asked ChatGPT to write 300 words on that topic. They then had to go to the scientific literature and find references for that information, add references to what ChatGPT wrote, and if something wasn't, wasn't correct, they had to fix it. They had to identify that correct information where they could put the citations and things that were not correct and maybe do some modification. And once they had this corrected version of that report, they had to feed it back into ch uh, ChatGPT and ask it to improve it in some ways. They had to identify something through their prompting of what they wanted to improve. Maybe they wanted it to use more active voice. Maybe they wanted, um, less flamboyant language. ChatGPT likes to throw in lots of adjectives. Maybe they wanted to remove that. So they had to identify something they wanted fixed within that writing. And then at the end, they had to reflect on it, talking things about what ChatGPT did well, what prompts worked, and what is the importance of that human oversight. So through these assignments, we're really focusing on identifying the benefits of these tools and what works well, what doesn't work well, and getting to the students to understand their limitations. Uh, moving on from looking at an assignment, an interesting discussion that came out of asking my colleagues about how they used ChatGPT was with Dr. Amy Todd, who didn't have an assignment based on ChatGPT, but she had open book, open web assignments. These are exams in the course. And so the first exam, they just did it at home as normal as an open book exam. There was a time constraint on it. And then after the midterm, she did anonymous polling of the class to understand did they use AI when they were writing this exam at home? And if they, what sort of tools they were using, how the tools were used, did they use their textbook, did they use chat GPT, did they Google things, did they have a reference sheet, and what was most effective? And then they talked as a class for developing some class standards going forward of what they thought was acceptable behavior in the exam and the use of these tools. Um, so what she found out, a third of the class admitted to using uh, AI tools during their exam. Um, this all but one of them used ChatGPT. And when they compared the tools, they found that the ChatGPT was just the quickest. It allowed them to get information really quickly, where a textbook you might have to flip through in order to find what you were looking for. Um, using the, a reference sheet, their cheat sheet if they made it, this was the best method if they spent the time to make the reference sheet before the exam. Um, and if ChatGPT gave something that was unfamiliar that they had to fact check, then it was no longer faster. So what they liked when they asked ChatGPT is they got an answer and they're like, oh yeah, that's what we learned in class. They can answer their question based on that. So they wanted it to jog their memory. When they got something, I was just like, oh, I haven't seen that before. Then they're like, okay, I should maybe fact check this. I'm not sure if it's telling me the truth. Then it was no longer beneficial on the exam. Um, and they thought it was really useful for the multiple choice questions. Um, which is a bit dangerous that they're using this to answer multiple choice questions. But the long answers, they said, it wasn't really that helpful. Um, that really that came to where they had to do more fact checking or rewrite it. So they didn't find it as useful there. And then also notably, 
there was a group of students who lost a significant amount of marks on their exam because they trusted ChatGPT and it gave them an incorrect answer for a question. So she has said she was marking the exam, she had a lot of answers, and she's like, why are all the students answering this question with this incorrect answer? So she threw her question into ChatGPT. I'm like, oh, they're giving me the answer ChatGPT gave me. And so that highlighted the discrepancy, why they were all getting it wrong. They didn't have time to fact check that information. So what did the class decide on moving forward? They decided that they needed to use terms and concepts that were introduced in the class. ChatGPT doesn't know what terms you introduced in your lectures, and it will often use terms that are more in the scientific literature, maybe not something you talked about in terms of a definition in the class. And they also said you need to directly and concisely answer a question. When you ask ChatGPT a question, it typically gives you a lot of definitions, it's really wordy, and Quite often, it doesn't ever actually answer the question. It just gives you information related to that question. So the students, if they got information from ChatGPT, they needed to rewrite it in their own words and then connect it back to that lecture content with those terms and concepts. And avoiding plagiarism and being mistakenly identified as plagiarism, they had to rewrite everything themselves. They couldn't take a long answer directly from ChatGPT because there's no way to determine if two students have the same answer, both from ChatGPT, if it's from ChatGPT, or if they copied from one another. So to prevent this, they all have to write in their own words, even if they're using these tools. So I thought it was a really good starting point for going forward of looking at how AI tools are implemented in our exams when we're doing open book exams. It's definitely something the students are using and that we need to be aware of. And then last example is within the biochemistry honors thesis course. So this is our um, fourth year students doing their honors thesis projects. We have a course in which we talk to them about common things all the students need to know. So writing and giving presentations. As part of this course, I gave them a lecture on using generative AI tools for writing and the pros and cons of different techniques and the pros and cons of generative AI in, in general. And we did a discussion of prompting. When I did this, I didn't just limit it to chat GPT, but I talked about a variety of different tools. These are all freely available in Canada that the students can be using. So I gave them some examples that are useful for grammar. So Grammarly, this is a generative AI tool that a lot of people I'd say recommend to students to use to improve their grammar. So this is one of the examples. Um, Word counter, paper reader, quill bot, they give different information on an active voice or repetition of words within their writing. So they're a way for students to get stats on their writing and understand their common mistakes. And then a bunch of general use, uh, generative AI tools, um, chat, GPT, three, fine, chatasonic, perplexity, illicit, consensus, and Poe. So we went through each of these tools, what they are good to be used for and what are some of the cons or things you need to be careful about when using these tools. Then as a class, we did an in-class exercise and discussion about these different tools. The students came up with a list of topics they thought should go in the introduction of their thesis. They were working on writing their introduction at this point. And then they asked multiple of those tools, generative AI tools, what the tool thought should go in an introduction of a thesis on whatever topic their thesis was on. The students then compared these two lists, what they came up with and what the generative AI came up with. And what they really found is most of what they were working on for their honors research was way too new, new for the generative AI to know about it. It was not in the database of facts that the um, tools are trained on, so it really wasn't that helpful. It was helpful maybe for those first couple really obvious concepts that needed to go into their introduction. But then beyond that, the tools got lost. They didn't know what they were um, researching on. They did find if any of those tools, they actually liked Find better than ChatGPT. And why they like this is Find actually gives you scientific sources where it gets that information from. And so they liked that it would sit, give them a summary of maybe you should talk about topic X in your introduction. To learn more about topic X, here's a paper to go read. So it linked the two together and allowed them to get information from the scientific literature as well. Um, 
We gave them a statement on using generative AI in their writing. We haven't banned them from using it for writing their thesis. We base this on El Savier's policy for AI in scientific writing. And so students aren't done, so we're not sure yet how many students are acknowledging or using the generative AI in their writing. But it'll be interesting because we have said if they use it, they do have to acknowledge it in their thesis and they have to use it in an ethical way. Um, so when we see the honors thesis at the end of the semester, it'll be interesting to know of our 21 students if they actually use these tools or not after learning a little bit more about them. So in conclusion, the generative AI is not going anywhere. We need to learn with it. This tool is going to become more and more prevalent in our society. I think I heard last week that Microsoft now has generative AI tools that are going to be integrated into your Microsoft apps, Microsoft Word, Excel, PowerPoint. And I think these are going to become just like your spell checker you have within these tools that you're going to have your generative AI helper or checker for your documents. Once they become standard in those tools, they're even more widely accessible to our students when they're working on it. So I think we need to start to teach our students to work with these tools, teach them what are the benefits of these tools, what are the cons, and how to ethically use these generative AI tools. Um, focusing on that reliability of information, what information you can get from generative AI, and how to fact check that. Where we go for reliable information, and through some of these exercises, I think the students are really starting to understand where that line is drawn for accurate information from generative AI and using that scientific literature to back that up. And really, I've been teaching the students throughout the year of don't ask these AI tools to do anything that you wouldn't ask another human to do. So it's a really simple way to think about the ethics of it. If you want your student, a uh, student wants generative AI to read over their essay, and provide them suggestions on how to improve it. This is something you could ask your classmate to do. Therefore, I would say this is an ethical use of AI. We're just getting some suggestions on getting AI to say, you're overusing passive voice, maybe consider using more active voice. That is a helpful comment to the student that the generative AI can do. Giving the generative AI the entire assignment question, saying, do my assignment, that's not an ethical use. And you wouldn't think it is ethical if you asked your classmate to do your assignment for you. So this is a, I found is a really quick way for students to have that check of ethics for these tools. Um, yeah, so that's all I have for my presentation today. Uh, thank you for attending and thanks for my colleagues for their um, discussions in preparing this and learning how people in the department are using these generative AI tools. And I'll open up for questions. Well, there is one question by Gillian Westcott, and that is actually a general question, not towards the presenters themselves, herself, but I'm going to read it aloud. Um, does anyone have a statement that they include in their course syllabi, course outline regarding the ethical use of chat GPT? So if you have anything like that. Yeah, so I put up on the slide what we've been putting up in our course outline for use of generative AI, but I believe CITL also has a set of statements for course outlines. Personally, I really struggle with the idea of acknowledging ChatGPT uh, for a few reasons. For one, I'll add to it. Um, when students are coming to this university or any university, they often don't know about citation or referencing anyway. Uh -huh. We really have to teach them a lot, and even by the time they finish their degree, often they don't know. Um, when we have students write papers, they cite sources. And one of the things I do is I like to go to their source to see if A, the information actually came from that source, and B, if they've try to analyze the information right in their own words as opposed to just copying a mm -hmm. paragraph verbatim. So when we're doing this ChatGPT acknowledgement, we're saying it came from ChatGPT, but I don't have that ability to go back and see where this information came from, what it looked like. So I'm just taking their word for it that they're not just copying swaths of data from ChatGPT. And I mean, the information is not sourced there anyway, mm -hmm. so it's probably not the best source of information. But I would say acknowledging ChatGPT is kind of like saying, I got this information from Google search. You got it from a website or an academic journal or somewhere, and you can point the instructor to that so they can look at it. 
Whereas with saying you got it from ChatGPT, there's nothing to, to do that with. So for me, if I were going to allow that, there is the ability in ChatGPT to save the chat. And I would tell the students to use that link to the save chat and put that in the reference list. So at least you have some ability to go back and look at it as opposed to just saying ChatGPT. Yeah, so one thing I'll say for acknowledging ChatGPT is that we say the students are, are credible for any information they put in there. And ChatGPT is not a source you go to get scientific information. It's not to be reused in replace of a reference. You still need your references in there. And it's definitely a good way for students to hand in like different drafts of a report so that you can see the progression. And I also agree, those uh, chats with the ChatGPT Though, including those as proof of how they used it. It can be a good way moving forward as well. Uh, so thank you, Katie, as usual, for teaching me new stuff. Uh, so having done 40 students, having marked 40 students, having done a this chat GPT assignment where they started with something that chat GPT generated, the thing that I really liked about it was like usually I am trying to correct for Oh, I can see the student is, you know, writing in something that's not their native language. And I'm trying to like figure out like what is, you know, what, what are they thinking versus like what is just like a language issue that sort of sounds like confusion, but maybe the student, you know, knows what they're doing. And the having them tell me their sort of dialogue with Chat GPT and the prompts that they gave it made it possible to um, sort of see their thinking process much more clearly in a way where I wasn't penalizing like non-native English speakers. It made it really even and really clean that way. So I would do it again. I found throughout the last year, our students have been really appreciative that we're talking to them about these tools and that we're not banning them all outright and that we're being aware that they're using these tools and talking about them, how to safely use them and what, how to ethically use them because they're all, most of them are using them. So, but they're just using them blindly. So teaching them about these tools and talking to the students after these classes, they've been really thankful that they've got to learn a bit more about these tools. Uh, the question is from Don M and I'm now reading it aloud. So you said that the tools are not great for learning in that they don't allow synthesis, synthesis just pattern recognition. Do you discuss this in your assignments or slash class as well? Um, yeah, so any class I've done where the students are doing an assignment using um, chat GPT, I talk about the pros and cons. In the 3105, so the physical biochemistry course this semester, we did an entire week on AI and talking about how these tools work, how it goes from data to an output. And the students had an understanding of how the, what's going on behind these tools. And so they could understand what's going on. And we talked about pros and cons of these tools before the students do those assignments. Another question by Don M, reading it aloud now. So if you are not AI experts, is there a source for this or do you give guest lectures? <laughs> no. Um, so I've only recently started to learn about how AI works and machine learning works in the last uh, few years. And I found it was, there's some really great information on YouTube of lectures from other universities about these tools and how these tools work. And so I thought those were really useful um, for learning about these tools. When we are talking about ChatGPT, like mainly we are uh, like referring to version three, right? That yeah. the student have access. What do you think about version four that they need I mean, I'm thinking probably they give them more information in terms of validity. Yeah, like I've heard good things about ChatGPT4. I haven't spent too much time looking at it because it's not the freely available yeah. version that the students are using, but I have heard really good things that it is a significant improvement over ChatGPT3. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, some of those other tools like uh, Find that gives the sources is really good. And that's a freely available tool. Um, yeah, so Find gives tools. Illicit is for uh, literature searching. So it summarizes a bunch of articles. So that's another one that's really nice for getting uh, sources involved. Consensus, you ask it a question and it tells you what is the consensus within the literature. 
So it gives you both sides of the argument and whether the literature or the internet is preferred one way. Um, so you ask it, um, is sugar bad for your health? And it'll tell you 90% of the literature says yes or, and it gives you the sources to go with each side. Um, so it categorizes it, which is quite nice. Um, yeah, the poll was a customizable. It's a little more complex of a tool to use. Um, forget perplexity and chatosonic. <laughs> I couldn't have been too impressed with them if I can't remember what they do. 